Okay. Give me one moment to get on camera here. All right. So as expected, I'm learning. I'm slowly learning that OBS does not work. But I expect it now. Okay, so I'm good there. And the last thing I need to check is if I can go full screen. Typically, I cannot. All right, looks like it's going to work today. So, uh, welcome everyone to CSE 598 uh, Advanced Software Exploitation. Uh, my name is Robert Wassinger. Uh, I know uh, you may have seen on my ASU that Adam Dupay is listed as the instructor on this course. Uh, Adam is out of town, uh, so I'm filling in for him. In general, you're going to see me for most of these lectures, and a lot of your interactions are going to be with me. So for all intents and purposes, assume that I am the instructor. All right? Great. So I'm going to open with this slide, and I want you to take this slide seriously. Okay? This is not an introductory course. What is the title of this course? Advanced Software Exploitation. Okay? It is not introduction to software exploitation. It is advanced software exploitation. This class is going to be extremely difficult. Now, I know a lot of classes say, hey, this is going to be hard, right? I am not being sarcastic. I'm not exaggerating, all right? And I hope that you realize that over the course of the next week or so, all right? I have 11 topics to cover that are listed on the syllabus that were there when you signed up. There are actually 12, I dropped one. But there's 11 topics to cover in 16 weeks. That's a lot of material to go through. The expectation, if you are in this room and taking this course, is that you have prior Linux system security knowledge. It is a prereq, okay? You may not have taken our undergraduate CSE 466, but we make it available. You can see the content, the expectations for taking this course were listed on the syllabus. And I'm going to reiterate them today. All right? And for anyone that has taken um, you know, a Pone College course, sometimes we curve. I do not believe in curves. I don't believe in last minute curves. I believe in being very clear about how the course is going to run. I believe about giving you all of the information you need to make a decision that is correct for you. You will always know what your grade is in this course from day one, all right? But that will not suddenly change at the end of this course. So if you are not performing well, you are not performing well. If over the course of this week and or next week, you start having doubts as we go through the material, consider dropping the course. This is not going to suddenly get easier, and I'm not going to spend any time teaching any of the expected knowledge. So what is the day one expected knowledge? It's this right here. I expect everyone in this room to be comfortable and familiar with Unix tools. I expect you to be comfortable with the command line. You don't have to know Vim. You don't have to know Emacs. If VS Code is your editor, that's perfectly fine. Right? But I do expect you to know how to function in a Unix or Linux environment. I expect you to be fairly experienced with reverse engineering. Now, what is reverse engineering? Well, that means you, that you understand x86-64 assembly, both reading and writing it. It means that you're comfortable with a debugger. You know how to use GDB, right? Yes, GDB, that is the all-encompassing debugging tool. Uh, if you've taken, taken a class with me before, you know I love GDB and I use it all of the time to demonstrate and show how things work. I expect you to not necessarily be as good with GDB as I am, but definitely comfortable using it, because we will be debugging binaries that have no source. I don't think there is source for any binary in this entire course that you're going to be working on, and you're going to work on a lot of binaries. So if you don't know how to read x86, don't take this class. If you don't know how to use GDB and walk through a running process and understand what's going on, don't take this class. I'm not teaching GDB. 
making that very clear. I expect you to be experienced or at least have spent some time with some kind of static analysis tool. That could be IDA, that could be Ghidra, that could be Binary Ninja. I don't care. I'm tool agnostic. But you should understand how these tools work and how to use a disassembler. If you don't, you're playing from behind. I expect you to be able to write shellcode. And not only write shellcode, but write shellcode under constraints. Writing shellcode means that you understand x86. Under constraints means, what if I need you to write some shellcode, pass it into a binary, and you're not allowed to have white space? What if you're not allowed to have null bytes? What if I restrict your shellcode to, say, 13 bytes? Can you write that shellcode? This isn't something that you're going to be able to pull up online. This isn't something you're going to be able to pull up a tool and just fire it off and it's going to figure it out. Okay? If you don't understand the material, you're going to have a bad time. Let's see what else we have on here. Uh, knowledgeable about Linux syscalls, libc functions. Again, this kind of goes back to being comfortable with the Unix environment. I expect that you know how to perform a syscall in x86 assembly. I expect you understand a lot of common um, syscalls and libc functions, right? If you look at stirconf, you know what it is. If you know, look at fork or ioctl, you know what it is. Um, what else do we got here? Race conditions. So uh, race conditions, if you have a process that's multi-threaded or multiple processes that are interacting with a common resource, I expect you already know how to identify these and exploit them. Almost done through this list. Uh, understand how kernel modules work, at least at a basic level, and how to interact with them if they're exposed like over a file. All right. Uh, if you've taken CSE 466, you should have some experience with all of this. If you've taken a system security course somewhere else that has some substance to it, you should be able to do all of this. I expect that you know how memory corruption works, at least in a linear fashion. All right. This would be like buffer overflows. I expect you to understand how memory corruption works with pointers, so I expect that you can perform ROP. I expect that you understand if I say we're going to do a partial overwrite of a return address to redirect execution flow to some shell code that we have placed in an environment variable to then execute a second stage payload, that you can do that. Hopefully that's all easy breezy, everyone's got it. The slide is here so that we are clear about what the expectations are. Nice. <laughs> We're going to get there if I have time. So uh, languages, what do I expect you know? I expect you're somewhat familiar with Python, in particular the Pwn Tools module. I expect you're comfortable writing C, uh, reading and writing it. And we may, in fact, look at some other languages, both as source and compiled uh, over the course of this semester. And lastly, I expect that you are aware and somewhat knowledgeable about how to circumvent some common exploitation prevention mechanisms, such as NX, the non-executable bit, or non-executable pages, stack canaries. Uh, you understand what PIE is, or position independent um, executables, what ASLR is, what railroad is. If these terms are new to you, this is probably not the room to be in. Now, if there's one or two of these things that you don't know, but you're willing to figure it out on the fly, great, you might be able to pass this course. If not, seriously reconsider what you're doing this semester. This is a demanding course. How demanding is it? Here's the schedule. So, today is January 9th. Typically, we talk about a syllabus. I'm gonna talk about a syllabus, tell you how the course runs, it's great. Uh, you're getting an assignment. It's 16 binaries. It's going to cover pretty much everything that I listed on this previous slide. It's due on Monday. So this isn't a, I'm talking it up. I want you, and it's graded. This isn't like a, oh, you know, hey, you need to know this. It's like about 8% of your course grade. So we're setting the tone for how this course is going to move. These are the topics that we're going to cover, and this is the pace we're going to deal with them. This Friday, it's January 12th. Second topic, second material, coming out, coming out hot. It's what, four days from now. And we're gonna keep that pace through the entire semester of content coming out on Fridays and being due about 10 days later on the following Monday with an overlap. 
across all of these topics. Now, I realize that we may not be able to keep this pace, right? Uh, question, does the video need to be visible? It does not. Give me one moment though and I can fix it so you can see my smiling face. Boom. I don't know if that improved the stream, but I'm here now. Okay. Uh, so there are a couple topics that I'm going to run for two weeks. Uh, in particular, this first thing that's running on Friday, speculative execution. All right. Uh, we're going to perform specter attacks. We're going to perform meltdown attacks. You're going to write it from scratch, and you're going to understand how to exploit a CPU. It's the first thing we're going to do. The drop deadline is right in the middle of that. All right. The reason we're doing this is so that you have an idea of what we're going to do and you can make this decision. And I'm going to bring up the drop deadline every day until it passes. Not every day, but every uh, lecture, right? Every time you see me. Uh, advanced heap. I highlighted this because it's against spring break. I believe you should get a break. However, if we're going slow here and we need more time, we can extend that. At the tail end of this course, we're going to discuss real world binaries. So we're going to look at real CVEs. We're going to pull them uh, down, and we're going to work on them and exploit them. And I have one flex week, so I've got about five days here uh, of flex time that we can tack on here and there as needed, depending upon how the class is doing. Uh, finals week is 429 to 5.4. Uh, we will be running material through finals week. Okay, so how does this course work? I showed you a whole bunch of material. I said, hey, this is going to be brutal. Uh, this is a hybrid course, all right? But what that means is pre-recorded lecture content will be released before I talk about it. So every Friday, some module is going to launch. This Friday, it's Friday, I'm going to launch a module. It's going to be speculative execution. All right, this module is going to consist of several pre-recorded lecture videos and a collection of binaries with challenges that you need to exploit of increasing difficulty. Uh, I looked at like the first half of content, it's about 30 on average uh, across every module. Uh, as I said, speculative execution is going to be live this weekend. The expectation is sometime between Friday and Tuesday when we meet here, you watch that material. You watch it before class. All right. Now, if you don't watch it, then I'm just going to repeat what's on the pre-recorded lecture videos. And that's a waste of everyone's time. But if you do watch it and start on the material early, you're going to get stuck. And I want you to ask me, how do I get unstuck? If you ask good questions, I'll give you good answers. If you get good answers, you'll solve the challenges. That's how it works. Come prepared with questions. The earlier you tell me what you're stuck on, everyone, right? the better idea I have of what I need to communicate to help you get through this material. Grading. I said we're going to run material uh, through finals. The reason is because there are no exams. There is no final. The course grade is the average of your performance of all of these modules I'm throwing at you. That's it. I said that you'll always know what your grade is. Uh, we use a platform called Pwn.College. I'll talk a little bit more about it in detail in a bit. Uh, but you can always see your live grade on this website. So you'll always know how you're doing. So you get graded on modules. How are modules graded? Uh, modules are weighted as follows. 80% of a module's grade is just the number of challenges you solve. If there's 20 challenges and you solve 10 of them, you got a 50. Pretty simple. The other 20% is something that we call an early bird checkpoint. Now, in previous Pwn College classes, there we've done something that's called like early bird extra credit. Right? And somebody asked me on the Discord, hey, why are you doing a checkpoint? Why aren't you doing extra credit? Like this is, this is kind of mean. Right? And the answer is I looked at it and I kind of ran the numbers on how this influences your grade. And for those that achieve this checkpoint, having the checkpoint helps your grade more, unless you 100% the material. And I'm telling you right now, that people will not 100% this material. That's fine. 
That's the goal. The goal is to push you to your limit and let you see how far you can go. So how does this checkpoint work? Complete the first half of whatever I assign you in the first seven days. If you do that, you get 20% of the module grade. Great. Most modules are going to run for about 10 days, uh, as I showed on the course schedule. If at any point you don't solve a module by the due date, you can go through the material late, and you'll get 50% credit. And you can do that all the way until I poll grades to post them for ASU. Cool? Now, on the pro side, we do offer some extra credit, because I said the expectation isn't that you're going to like 100% all of the material. Now, the extra credit is offered over a couple of areas. The first is making memes. This is a low effort, high scoring area. Every semester and every time we've done a Pwn College course, we talk about memes. We say, post them. I'll give you 0.5% of the course grade for every good meme you post. A good meme will be on our Discord. We have a memes channel. You post a meme. If I like it and think it's relevant to the course, you know, something technically interesting, hey, this challenge is really hard. I was cruising through and I hit a brick wall. Oh, speculative execution, what the CPU is doing, I don't know, right? Whatever you think is funny, okay? Whatever you're thinking about going through this material, post a meme. If I think it's worth getting a chuckle out of, if you get a slight grin out of me, I'll like it. We want people to be engaging with this material. You do that every week for 16 weeks, it's 8% of the course grade. Awesome. All right, what's the other thing we can do? Well, you can be helpful. I'm one guy. And uh, right now, there's roughly about 60 of you. All right? I'm a pretty helpful person, but it, I need a force multiplier here. So if you help someone on the Discord, they can thank you using our automated bot. It's like a right-click thanks. Right? You'll get a thank you point that gets logged. And we have a logarithmic scale at the end of the semester. Does everyone know what a logarithmic scale is? Early ones are worth a lot more than later ones, right? So just helping someone five times will be like 3% of the course grade, right? But you need to legitimately help someone. This course encourages collaboration. I want open discussion. I want people talking about these challenges. That doesn't mean sharing code, but it does mean talking about the material. You talk in the Discord, somebody likes it, finds whatever you said helpful, they thank you, you get a point. In the end, you can get up to 5% of the course grade. So that is 13% of the course grade in total extra credit. How does this all influence your overall course grade when I ran the numbers? Well, if you do 49% of every single module, you're going to get a 39% in this course. Now, if you do 50% of every module, then you hit that checkpoint. And that checkpoint was worth 20% of the module grade. So the difference between 49 and 50% is pretty big, because you'll jump from a 40% to a 60% in this course. So at a bare minimum, try and hit that, that 60%, right? You didn't pass the course, but you did 20% better. Now, what if you did 50% of the material, and you posted memes every week, and you said some helpful stuff, right? You maxed out your extra credit. Well, you could do 50% of this material and you'd get a 73% CA, you'd pass this course. Okay, that's great. Plan ahead. The biggest mistake people make in these courses is they don't post memes, they don't engage with the Discord, they think, hey, I got this, and then something comes up, they hit a brick wall, and then it's too late. We can't roll back the clock and post 10 memes on the last day of class. You don't get it. All right. Now what if I do a little bit better? I get up through about 75% of the material. Okay, I hit the checkpoint, I get an 80%. It's a B minus. Not bad. But what if I did that 75% of the material and I memed away, I thanked some people, you know, I, I played along, I played the game. You'll get an A. Okay? Now, to get an A plus, if you did all of the extra credit, the bar is at about 84% of the material. Okay? So, this course is going to be extremely hard, but we offer a lot of extra credit. I don't think completing half of it, but playing along to pass is a high bar. But keep in mind, half of the material is going to take a non-zero amount of your time. So 
So if you are taking a heavy course load, please consider adjusting your schedule. So as I kind of alluded to earlier, how do you succeed in this course? You watch the lecture videos when they are released on Fridays. Was that a question? Okay. Uh, if anyone does have questions, please you know, raise your hand, ask. I like um, interacting with students. Uh, this is the most number of slides you're going to see from me. A typical lecture will be about five slides, which will mostly be covered with memes that you post. A great update as far as how is the class doing. And then we're going to jump into a terminal and do stuff. I'm going to do it live. This entire course is going to be live demos and answering your questions. That is what I want. I hate slides. So watch the pre-recorded material come Friday. Come prepared. Start working on the material. I don't care if you're stuck on problem one or you're stuck on the very last problem. Okay? Form a good question, throw it at me or let me know ahead of time, depending upon how complex it is, because I don't want to spend all of class solving one problem or like answering one question. In general, I don't solve problems on live streams. I'll answer your question, I'll break it down, I'll make an example. I want you to understand the material. I'm not going to give you code that will get you a flag. Right? Yes? Uh, when the videos are released on Friday, like mm -hmm. in the morning or like at midnight? Okay, uh, good question. So I haven't gotten to the slide yet, but I'm going to hold office hours on Friday. I'm going to do them at 4.30. Uh, slated time, time frame is 4.30 to 5.30. However, if there's enough students, there's enough people that are interested in stuff. Historically, I run late. It's not unheard of for me to stick around and answer your questions for up to about two hours. Around the two and a half hour mark, I, I get a little tired and I call it. So whenever I'm done with office hours is when I will release the material. So sometime Friday evening, probably around five, six o'clock. Good question. So while I watch the material early, ask questions to confirm understanding, participate in the course. All of the extra credit that's being offered is just about engagement. That's all it is. I'm not going to make you write a blog post every week and give you five points. I want you to actually talk about the material. And for the most part, it's your peers that are going to be judging that. So again, extra credit adds up. Can't roll back the clock. Meme early, meme often. All right, get those points, bank them. Take a look at the Discord here, or uh, I'm sorry, Twitch stream. Uh, Adam Dupay. Uh, all right, you're just playing mod. I don't see anything there. I'm going to assume we're good. So, uh, as I mentioned before, I hit the uh, giant live stream button. Uh, lectures are live streamed on Twitch. It's twitch.tv slash pwn college. Office hours will be live streamed on Twitch twitch.tv slash pone college. Uh, after a day or so, I try and get it same day, but it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, I do try and archive the videos up here at youtube.com slash pone college. Uh, the lectures and office hours will also uh, be embedded on the pone college website uh, when I get around to it, so within a day or two. So you will be able to access that material. Attendance is not required. It's highly encouraged because it's a lot harder to you know, answer questions and engage with you uh, if you're not here in person. But it's not required. We're all grown-ups. Okay? Uh, it is appreciated. It's a lot more fun talking to faces than it is to an empty room. So I appreciate it personally. If you are curious, there are prior iterations of some of these topics that are listed uh, on the Pwn College website. Right? So you can take a look at it as far as how was this content explored in the past. There are no guarantees that that content is what you will be assigned. You're free to look at it. Uh, you're free to do it. If it is something that's assigned, you'll get credit. It's fine. You did it already. You beat me. Uh, however, there's no guarantee that anything on that site is what will be your homework. So that's, uh, that's a gamble you can make. Oh, uh, there, the Twitch comment was if I could repeat the question that was asked. Uh, so I will roll back the clock here. Uh, the question was, uh, when will modules be released on Friday? Uh, because I was making the comment that every Friday uh, modules, these videos, and assignments will be released. And my answer was, 
that I will hold office hours at 4.30, and whenever I conclude office hours and I turn off the stream, the next thing I do will be releasing the module's content on Friday. So you'll find that that's probably about six o'clock, give or take. So on the topic of office hours, uh, this is me. Uh, you can find me on the Discord. Uh, my handle is Rob Waz. Uh, I'm a screaming Bill Nye head as far as the icon. So, if you, and if you've done anything on Pwn College, you've probably interacted with me already. I'm going to hold my office hours at 4.30. Uh, question. Uh, Twitch says modules are beholden to the rabbit holes then. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to get to it all, but I do have a number of updates planned for the content. So that is not just a general disclaimer, but probably a reality. Uh, Adam is also holding office hours. So Adam will hold office hours on Monday at 11 a.m. I don't know if he runs late because he has a bit more uh, rigid schedule than I do. Uh, and he is also available on the Discord. His handle is Adam D. I actually don't know what his icon is on the Discord, now that I'm thinking about it. Is, is it just a picture of Adam? All right, well, that's, that's not it. It's Shellfish Adam? Yeah, Blue Shirt Adam. Blue Shirt Adam? Okay. Man in Blue Shirt, yes. So the Man in Blue Shirt is Adam, who's also going to be an instructor for this course. Uh, one of the things that I think is worth bringing up is we've made a number of changes to Pwn College uh, with the new year, and some people have not been so happy about it. Personally, I'm ecstatic. So in the past, we've had previous, uh, previous iterations of office hours publicly available. Those have all been hidden. In the past, uh, we had years of chat logs on the Discord. So in savvy student, you know, could search the Discord and kind of find the, the secret nugget or secret clue I needed to move forward. The Discord chat's been wiped. If that was your plan, signing up for this course, I'm going to refer you back to that second slide. The expectation is that as a class, we will discuss this material on this Discord. We will help each other and collectively we will drag ourselves through it and learn a ton in the process. So, I said there's a lot of expectations for this course. And I also mentioned there's an assignment. Now, I didn't intend on the assignment to be visible earlier today, but it turns out it was. It is what it is. That first assignment is live right now. It's 18 review challenges. So again, there's no, this is how you do it. There is no pre-recorded lecture videos. This is what I expect you to be able to do on day one as someone sitting in this room. Topics and things that I know are covered in this material, and this is not necessarily all inclusive. Race conditions, mutexes, memory corruption, kernel debugging, all right, those mitigation techniques I mentioned, interacting with kernel modules. Uh, if you've heard of, has anyone heard of Yon85? We got, we got a couple, okay. Uh, Yon85, day one, all right? What Yon85 is, is a virtual machine. So you'll be reverse engineering a virtual machine that's going to be executing its own customized architecture on x86. And I expect you to be able to do that today. Yes? Are following challenges all going to be in Yon85 3? Uh, no. So Yon85 is cool, and I like Yon85. Uh, but Yon85 has its place. Right? I think Yon85 is great for reverse engineering and for understanding how CPUs work. Uh, I, Yon85 does have a place in speculative execution, right? Uh, because there's some interesting things you can do there. I do not anticipate Yon85 existing outside of, say, January. Right? Now, don't hold me to that because I may add something. Uh, but the goal is not to just flog people with Yon85 all semester. All right. Uh, I, I recognize that sometimes Yon85 gets in the way of what we're trying to learn. Okay? It isn't about making the impossible challenge for you. It's about getting you to understand the material. In this case, Yon85 serves a purpose. 
because I expect you to be able to reverse engineer it and understand it. Uh, this module also requires shell coding and it requires uh, buffer overflows. Uh, as I mentioned, it's due in seven days, so it's due Monday at midnight, if I recall correctly. Uh, question. Uh, people say they have heard of Yawn85 on low-level programming, so we're making it to other, other content creators, which is awesome. Glad to hear it. And as I mentioned, the microarchitectural exploitation content uh, will launch and be available this weekend, uh, which is the first real assignment, in my opinion, although both of these are graded. Okay. So this is typically the yeah, question. No? Okay. Uh, this is typically the last slide you'll see from me. Uh, it is what I intend on demoing if nobody has questions. If somebody has questions, I'd much rather demo what you are interested in than whatever it is that I have prepared, generally speaking. Because it's about optimizing for you and whatever you're stuck on. Okay? I want people to learn this material, but I do not want to underemphasize the difficulty of the content. So, my plan for the remaining 30 minutes that I got here. I'm gonna give you the dime tour of Pone College kind of show you what it is, uh, just out of curiosity. How many people know what Pone College is? So we're about 50%? Okay, uh, so this is worth doing. Uh, I'm gonna show you Pone College, I'm gonna show you how to get set up so that you can join our Discord, uh, make sure everything's configured so that I know that you're a student in this class uh, and kind of get started on this material. And then with whatever time I have remaining, we're gonna talk about the very first problem of this assignment until I run out of time. I will not solve it. All right, with that, does anyone have any questions about any of the slides or any of the things I brought up? Anything that you think is important that I did not bring up? Yes? Okay, the question was, where are office hours? That is a good question. So I was talking about this actually right before this lecture with someone. Who would be interested in in-person office hours if they were offered? Right now I don't have a room reserved for office hours and the intention was to live stream them uh, you know, just over the internet and everyone can attend it from home. The, the option is, is if I do live office hours, they would be, I, I'll reserve some room here, I don't know where, we'll figure it out, and I will show up here at 4.30. I can't speak to, speak to Adam, maybe he can chime in there. Um, who would be interested in in-person office hours? I got one, two, three, four, five, six. It's about 10% of the class. Okay, let me see if Adam has a answer for him. Uh, okay, Adam has an answer. So I can't commit Adam, uh, but 10% is enough to where I will consider it, right? Uh, I'll see if I can reserve a room and hold office hours both in person and stream them. Now one of the difficulties there is it's gonna be a very similar setup to this because I don't want to stream students, right? Uh, so we'll probably have a stream time where like you can ask questions and I'll live demo it, we'll stumble our way through, turn off the stream so if anyone needs like a direct live interaction, uh, we'll do that after the streaming component's over. Wait, was there a question or comment over here? Let me double check. Yeah, Adam says it's hard for him uh, to do in-person office hours. He also says it's hard to stream in-person office hours. So we'll, I, I can only speak for myself, um, but I'm going to attempt it, right? Uh, and if it, do, if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work and we'll revisit it, okay? Uh, but I wanna do everything I can to help you guys succeed. There's a good question. Uh, any other questions? Cool. All right, so let's take a look at Pone College. Uh, Pone College is a publicly available website. You can hit it right now. It is pone.college. That lands you right here. It says pone.college, learn the hack, gives you a little bit of story about kind of how this platform uh, developed. You are in the presence of greatness. Uh, that man over there, Connor Nelson, is one of the creators of Pone College, took him by surprise. 
Uh, so he may be you know, hiding in the corner there, but he's actually assessing me. Right? That's what he's doing. So how, how does this, this website work? Well, if I, this is where things go off the rails. Uh, open Pwn College uh, right here in an incognito window, so I'm not logged in. Uh, you see register up here at the top. All we ask for is a username. Your username does not have to be your ASU ID. In fact, I encourage it to not be. Do not make it your name. If you want to be anonymous online, make it whatever you want. This should be a hacker handle, okay? And when you're talking to me on Discord, I don't match the face. I don't know who you are. So feel free to ask dumb questions. I won't know it's you. All right. Similarly, create an anonymous username, whatever you think is great. An email, email does not have to be your ASU email, but it does help me if you happen to use it. Uh, and then a password. We only use the email so that we can reset your password uh, if you forget it, which happens, unfortunately, too often. Uh, once you are logged in, you'll see up here at the top, there are a number of icons. Uh, the first one is dojos. This course is going to run entirely on this website. So you're going to spend your entire time either on this website or in an SSH terminal. Okay? Uh, these dojos feature a number of topics. If you scroll down a little bit, we have courses. This is CSE 598 for the spring 2024 semester. We click here. You won't get this admin button, but you will see courses if you're set up correctly, which I'll show in a moment. Uh, this is our first assignment here, Systems Security Review. We click on here. You're going to get a little bit of flavor text. I, I had ChatGPT generate this amazing poem. Right? I, I, I thought it was pretty good. All right. Uh, so, so read and enjoy that for a moment before we, we start things. Uh, then you see here challenges. I'm going to click this first thing. And you're going to get a little bit of hint. Now, this isn't a very helpful hint because you don't know Yon85, but you'll also find that I don't write helpful hints in general, so this isn't like a surprise. Uh, you have two options, start and practice. The difference between these two, if you hit start, then you are trying to solve the challenge for credit. If you hit practice, which is how I always start things, then you have the ability to run sudo. I hope everyone knows what sudo is. All right, it means you have root access uh, in our kind of challenge environment. It doesn't make sense to test you if I allow you to be root. So we hit practice and it popped up and said challenge started, right? So what does that mean? Well, there's a couple ways you can interact with our platform. The first way is this workspace button. This will give you a VS Code-like interface uh, where you can write code. This is all running in a challenge environment. Uh, you can open a terminal here. Somebody, does anyone know what the shortcut is to open a terminal? Tilda. What is it? Control, shift, tilde. Control, shift, tilde. Okay. I don't use VS Code. You can tell. So I have a terminal window down here. Uh, if this is all in a virtualized challenge environment. So the challenge is located in the challenge folder. We type ls. Uh, we, it's a little bit small, but it says toddler sys level 1.0 and toddler sys level 1.0.ko. If you're familiar with kernel modules, .ko is a kernel module. Now, in order to work on this challenge, because it has a kernel module, this is a limitation of our infrastructure, you need to enter a virtualized environment. Now you're going to enter a VM. And you do that right here with VM start. It's going to start the VM and then VM connect. And that will drop your shell into a VM that has this kernel module running within it. Okay. VS Code, not my preferred way of working with it, as you can see. But what you can see is my prompt, probably a little bit small there. I'm failing here at the window. Uh, but my prompt starts with uh, VM practice. It's how I know I'm in the VM. You can still access uh, all of your 
same thing. So I list the challenge folder, I see those same files. It's a VM with the same file system mounted into it. So any files you create outside of the VM are mounted inside the VM. You really only need the VM so that you can interact with the kernel that is, or the kernel module that is running in that VM. Uh, somebody makes the comment on Twitch, which is a good comment. If that was on Discord, I would give you a thanks. It's a good point. Uh, some of the challenges cannot be solved without using practice mode. Maybe you need to have root access to reason about the binary, right? Maybe you need a GDB attach, for example. You can only do that if you have root access. So, so there are uh, reasons to run practice mode. So th this gives us kind of this, this virtualized uh, VS Code interface. Your second option for interacting with this environment is a full Linux desktop. So, if you like this, you need to run some other tool. Uh, you can click this desktop icon. It'll drop you into a full uh, Linux desktop where I can open up terminal windows and again, if I LS challenge, I see those same files. Okay? Uh, so if you need to use a graphical tool, this is going to be the way to go. The third way to interact with the platform is over SSH. The instructions to set up SSH to make it work as far as giving us your key uh, is on the home page. So read the instructions on pwn.college. There's a setup thing, you paste your key and then we're good to go. And if I is that big enough to see like an SSH hacker at dojo.pwn.college. I already have my key set up here. I now have an SSH connection into that virtual challenge environment. And just to show I'm on the same box, there's those same files. Okay? So use whatever method of interacting with it that makes sense for you. My personal preference and what you'll see me do like 99% of the time is have this screen right here. It's just a terminal up. My workflow is tmux split vim. So this is what you're going to see from most of your um, demos from it. Something to this effect. Any questions about the platform? Yes. Will Sense AI. Oh, Sense AI. Uh, that's, that's a good question. So it is available. Okay. Uh, I said earlier that I generated the, the blurb here with ChatGPT. That, that's fair. Right? You can use it. It can be helpful. It can also be an utter trap. Okay? Because when those type of tools go wrong, they go horribly wrong. So if you're really stuck on something and there's nobody answering on the Discord, sure, reach for ChatGPT, use Sense AI. Sense AI should do better than ChatGPT. There, there's a number of enhancements where it, it takes the context of kind of what you're doing in the environment. So hopefully it produces better output than just talking to ChatGPT or some other uh, AI model, right? Um, for those that are unaware, uh, there is a chat icon up here. Now that brings you to Discord. How do I get to Sense AI? I actually don't know because I don't use it. Then I, oh, it's help. Yeah. I never hit the these other buttons. Okay. Uh, so so here it is, uh, and it has a OpenAI kind of like interface. It's a chat interface. Um, Let's, let's say I want to analyze a binary. How do I do it? Let's see, let's see what it says. And I have no idea that this could be a, an absolute mistake. Con Connor's over here cringing. Uh, question, uh, what's Pwn debug? Is that a GDB plugin? I think you're being sarcastic because I know who that is. Uh, if for those that are unaware, uh, Pwn Debug is a GDB plugin. Okay, so what did it tell me? There are several tools available for the Linux binary analysis, including using file, running strings, 
object dump, read elf, and JDB. So I'd tell you to use one of those tools. Uh, I'd tell you to use JDB uh, because some of these other tools are useful, uh, but not for the advanced software exploitation type of content uh, that we are going to be going through in this course. Now, why, why is this more helpful? Well, I didn't have anything open in the challenge environment, right? So there wasn't anything for it to pull from. Uh, but what it does know is my terminal. It has an idea of what I have going on there, right? And we can see that there. Uh, the other thing that it knows is what file was I recently working on? In this case, I actually haven't written a file, uh, so it has no context there. Uh, but it does have some idea of what you're doing in our challenge environment, and it tries to incorporate that into answering your question. The AI model does not know the solution to the challenges, so if you think you're going to metagame this and like break out of it, it, it doesn't know it, man. So, so game away. Good question. Oh, somebody made the comment that it does not recommend man pages. I'm famous for two things, telling you to read a man page and use GDB. Okay. Uh, the la I'm not going to have much time uh, to actually work on the challenge. But uh, last thing I need to talk about is how do you link Pwn.college uh, with the Discord and kind of with this course? How do I know that you're a student? I believe that is under Dojos. You'll select the course here, so we are CSE 598, and you'll hit this course button. Uh, the first thing you'll see is the syllabus. This is an updated syllabus. I was editing this, I don't know, last night, this morning. Uh, so take a look if you want to see the updated syllabus. I believe I covered all of the immediately um, pertinent changes uh, in the slide deck, but feel free to take a look uh, if you do have questions there. I said you can always see your grades. We hit grades. We'll see right here, right now, I have a 0% E. I have 16 challenges to do. They're due Friday or uh, Monday at midnight. Every time that a new module is uploaded, it'll be added on here. Extra credit is not listed on the grades page. Uh, it gets uploaded periodically. It is one of the things that we're going to try and add here in the near future so that you truly have all great information that you need. Identity. This is the important part. I need your ASU student ID. This is how I know you're an ASU student. And setup. This is how I know that you're a student in the Discord. You click setup. It's pretty easy. There's what, five check marks, X's? I need five green check marks. If you got five green check marks, you're set up right. Okay. You may not have an ASU icon next to your name or something. I don't care. You've got five green check marks, and you're in the ASU uh, CSE 598 Discord channel. Right? You have that role. Then you're set up correctly. So what are the instructions here? Create a Pwn.college account. I showed you how to do that. Create a Discord account. If you are not on Discord, get hip to it. Discord's the way to go. I was a Slack guy for a while, but I've, I've converted. All right. 99% of communication in this class will be on this Discord. Okay? Announcements, changes, questions, answers, and I don't like DMs. You can DM me, like I'm not going to smite you, but I want communication to be open. Nobody in this class should have information that someone else doesn't. So that means if somebody asks for help on a challenge, I want to have that discussion publicly on the Discord so that someone else can look at it, someone else can learn from it, and no one is at any disadvantage because they managed to grab my attention. That's the idea here. So create a Discord account. It's important. There is no Canvas. There is no anything else. It's all Discord. Join the Discord server. Click the link. You'll get in there. Uh, link your Pwn Dollage account with the Discord. We provide nice little here links to get it done. And then lastly was that first thing that I showed, which was enter your ASU ID. That makes it all happy so that I know you're on the Discord, you're a student, and I can export it uh, to ASU when the time comes. Okay, I got 10 minutes. Any last minute questions? Yes?
the, I'm going to say the first half, I missed the second half. If I'm a newbie in, in security, which you are, What would be the key takeaway? Yeah. The, the key takeaway is that you understand software vulnerabilities. Okay? Uh, if we, the question was, if I'm a newbie, what can I take away from taking this course? Right? What do I get out of this? And I, I listed all of this daunting stuff, said it's going to be really hard. We're going to discuss these topics. Are you familiar with speculative execution? Have you ever performed a specter attack? OK, we're going to do that in two weeks. right? And we're not going to do it once. We're going to do it multiple times. We're going to do it on a virtualized VM. If you are in security and you're interested in exploitation, you're interested in exploitation research, you're interested in binary analysis, right? It is all about picking up pieces and understanding weird machines, things that don't make sense. How do I take something and make it behave not how it was intended? And we're going to do that repeatedly every week, week after week, we're going to take a look at one type of explo exploit, and then we're going to throw it to the side. We're going to grab something brand new. But I can't talk about format string attacks and accessing memory and modifying stuff if you don't have that prerequisite knowledge. right? And, and that's why we're having this talk today. Because I do not want to fail students. I don't want to set you up to fail. I want everyone here to succeed. However, with this schedule, we do not have the time to one-on-one, -on -one, this is how I use GDB, this is what a pointer is, this is how I examine memory, this is the stack, this is the heap. We don't have time for that. So I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Format string attacks, it's a very common thing that you'll find in code out in the wild. Right? Now once I know how to do formatted string attacks, that gives me uh, something that's called a primitive. So I could like arbitrarily read some data or arbitrarily write some data. Well, what's the next thing we do? We start looking at file structure attacks. Again, it's a different vector, right? It's a different vector of attack, a different weird thing that we can abuse and exploit and take advantage of. And again, that's going to show us, hey, we can generate arbitrary write primitives or arbitrary read primitives, or we can leverage these to gain control of a system. Then we're gonna spend three weeks, looks like, on heap exploits. Heap exploits are all about pointers where they are in memory, how they, how they point to each other, and how can I modify kind of these interactions that occur at a low level in the heap. And we're going to look at every layer of the heap. Again, there's this like, specific area of computing. Now, the, fir the first half here is all Linux. But if you're on a Windows system, Windows system, is there a heap? Yes, there is. These are all generic concepts that exist in computing. And so even if you're not interested in security, now you said that you're, you're new to security but interested in it, but even for people that are not directly interested in security, going through this type of content will make you think about computers differently. It'll make you think about writing code differently. It'll make you understand parts of how your computer works that you would never encounter before. Not necessarily this class, Uh, not necessarily this class, um, but the undergraduate ASU course, uh, CSE 466 System Security. Uh, we have a lot more not security people focused on it, and that is the number one thing that we hear. It's like, I wasn't interested in security, but this is super interesting because I now have such a low-level understanding of how things work, it just blows their mind, right? So you're going to learn things that you never even thought of learning, not because I tell you it, but because you will interact with it and figure it out and make sense for yourself. This course is all about hands-on solving things. Hopefully that answers your question. Now, I don't know you specifically and I don't know your background, right? But if you are new to security, take this slide to heart. I'm just serious, okay? Okay, Twitch, Twitch is just like memeing away over here. So, yes? Yeah, I, I have done CSE 545 in the course, like the soft, software security. Okay. So, so I have the concepts of like ROP for the exploitation. I might need a refresher on the assembly and like uh, I don't have some idea about static analysis. So like will I get my, like I guess. It, it's, it's going to be hard. 
okay? I, the, the question uh, for Twitch was, hey, I took this other graduate course, right? It wasn't this system security course that you're talking about, Robert. I haven't gone through that material. So I know what, let's go to this, this list here. I know about ROP. I have some idea about memory corruption. But I've never used a static analysis tool like Ida or Ghidra. Okay. okay. Like, you might be able to succeed in this course. I don't want to, you don't hit the requirements, just straight up. So you are working at a disadvantage, right? And as long as you know that, and I've already said this is a demanding course, you personally will need to put in more work to make up the difference, right? And that's part of why this first assignment is what it is. Because you will, tonight, if you log on to Pone College and look at this first challenge, you're going to need to use a static analysis tool. In fact, let's do that. Very first thing for this challenge, let's actually run it and see what we have going on here. For those that are unaware, who's, who's familiar with CTF challenges? They know what a flag is. Okay, there's a decent amount here that don't. I'm glad I asked. Okay, how do these challenges work? There is some binary in this challenge folder. In this case, there's two. I said one is a user space binary, which I know this because I can run file on toddler sys. Uh, I have to run it on challenge toddler sys. Uh, we see that this is an elf file, and elf is a Linux executable file. And it says that it is dynamically linked, blah, blah. It tells us some other stuff. What is this other file? It is also an elf. Uh, but in this case, it is a, did I run? Dot ko. Uh, it is also an elf. Uh, however, in this case, we see that the output is slightly different. We know it's a kernel module because that is what the .ko signifies. Now, I said for the kernel modules, we need to use this VM. So I'm going to run VM start. I'm going to run tmux. If you don't know tmux, tmux is amazing. I'm going to run VM connect. This is going to drop me into that VM. I'm going to run the challenge binary. This challenge binary is going to give us a little bit of help text output. Uh, this says you may upload custom shellcode to do whatever you want. Uh, for extra security, this challenge will only allow certain syscalls. This binary allows you to upload over standard in shellcode that will get executed. However, you can only perform, does it say? It does not. So it's, it's going to allow you to perform some restricted subset of syscalls. It's going to perform that restriction via a mechanism named setcomp. Again, throwing out words. I hope you understand what they mean. It also says it opened proc YPU. Okay, and if I give it some input and hit enter, then this is going to print out a, an interpretation of our bytes uh, because this is a helpful challenge. Not all of them are helpful. Uh, it's going to give us some idea of what's going on inside of the binary. And in this case, AAA is not valid shellcode, so it executed, it failed, it blew up. Great. Uh, what's the next thing I need to know? Well, I need to understand what the heck is going on in this thing. And the first tool that most people will reach for is some type of static analysis tool. So to your question, will I succeed? Uh, how quickly can you learn this tool? Because you need to learn this tool now. And that is why we are doing this. So I'm opening Ida, but there is uh, Ghidra as well as Anger Management, if that's your jam. So uh, this is Ida. Uh, we see some assembly instructions right here. Hopefully you know what assembly is. You've seen that before. If I hit tab, tab is the almighty button in Ida. Uh, it will attempt to translate that assembly to C code or C like code. So I can quasi understand what is this binary doing. Okay. It is not perfect. It will lie to you. All disassemblers lie, not just Ida. So it is your job to figure out what is the truth and what is not. The ultimate goal of all of these challenges is to capture the flag. The flag is a file located at the root of your file system. It is slash flag. And you'll see here that if I am a normal user and I cat the flag, I do not have permission to cat the flag. Who can cat the flag? Root. If I hit sudo su, you'll see that my name on the right hand, left hand side 
uh, has changed from hacker to root. Root is an elevated user uh, on the system. Root. Aha. Uh -huh. Cat flag uh, can output uh, that. Now, once you have obtained the flag, this is obviously a practice flag. Why is it a practice flag? Because I opened the challenge in practice mode. That's why I can be root. It would defeat the purpose if this was a valid flag. However, once you have a flag, you will copy it. You will go back to the dojo where we started. You will find our dojo, and you will paste that value in this box and hit submit. That will get you one point. How do I cat the flag? You exploit the files that are located in challenge. With that, I'm out of time. I don't believe in holding you late. Let me double check on Twitch if there's anything that I forgot, but that is how we're gonna roll. Uh, somebody says they're really excited for new Windows material. They're currently in 365. If you are, 365 is a great course. You probably shouldn't be watching this stream now. Okay, uh, going once, going twice. Uh, question. Uh, wait, you have to. You have to be able to copy the entire pwn dot college. Yes. So the question was, what's a what's a flag, right? Uh, I cat this file, and it said pwn dot college dot practice. The flag is not practice. The flag is pwn dot college, including the curly braces. This entire thing. That is what goes in the box. Yes, question. Okay. Uh, the question is, if I have already dealt with these challenges or seen these material, right, do I need to do it again? The answer is whatever the website says. In general, if you solve a challenge, you get credit. I don't care if you did it a month ago, if you do it the last day right before the deadline. That is why I have this slide that says, eh, where is it? Yes, prior iterations of topic content can be found on the Pwn.College website. However, it is not formally what we're going to be doing until it's assigned to you. If you happen to say, hey, I'm gonna work ahead, I'm gonna try and go do this, this other thing, man, I give up on whatever, whatever I'm doing right now, you're welcome to, right? If you bet right and you solved it before I assigned it, you get credit. The question is, can you do it? Yes. Okay, so the question for Twitch is, for whatever reason, the grades page is showing something strange. I'm going to not answer that on the stream. I'll turn off the stream and we can look at what's going on there specifically. But the answer ultimately is, if it's solved before the day that it's due, you get credit. If you did it today, you did it yesterday, you did it six months ago, I don't care. If I assign it and it's done at the, end, at the due date, you get credit. Any other questions? Good questions, thank you. Anything else? Okay, last check for Twitch. All right, we're still talking about flags and Vim. Okay, with that, I will leave you. I appreciate you all. Uh, I will be holding office hours on Friday. Uh, as I said, I'm gonna try and reserve a room. I, and if I manage to get it done before this Friday, I will announce it on the Discord. Question. Uh, are there any resources like to just perform the predictions? So the entire ASU uh, CSE 466 course, all of the lectures and all that material, uh, is on that same website, on Pwn College. So if uh, you wanted to know, you know, how do we teach it, uh, you can go to 466, fall 2023, right? This, this last semester, uh, the course that we taught that has all of these prerequisites, you can see the modules here uh, for any of the topics. So if there is something that you want to refresh, like, hey, I really want to know uh, how to reverse engineer, right? So this is gonna be, how do I use GDB? How do I use these static analysis tools? Great. Uh, there are pre-recorded lectures that are what we used in that course. You're free to watch these lectures uh, to try and catch up, all right? Uh, 
anything that we like encourage you to learn is going to be something that's open and free, uh, more than likely something that we record uh, specifically to cater to our content. Good question. Anything else? I know I'm holding you now, so. Okay, I'm gonna kill the stream. I appreciate everyone. I'll see you on Friday, uh, hopefully, uh, either uh, on Twitch or in person if we pull it off. Good luck. <laughs>